Hey, my name is Dr. TK. I want to welcome you back to the podcast. And I am a clinical psychologist and the number one therapist business coach. Today, we are going to be talking about how to find the perfect office location in 2021. And then I will take you behind the scenes of what it was like for me in the beginning of my private practice years to have four private practice offices in just two years. So let's go ahead and jump in. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. And so the first thing that I wanna to talk to you today about is contracts. And so one of the things that you wanna take in consideration when you are thinking about having a private practice office is will it require you to have a lease or will it require you or you can make a choice to do like month to month. And so one thing that you wanna take in consideration when you're looking at the differences is what is the length of time that you're able to do, for example, a lease. Some offices you will be able to do a six month lease, a nine month lease, or a 12 month lease. And then sometimes you will actually be able to do a two year lease, a five year lease, if you ask for it. And so just because it is not listed does not mean that it does not exist. You just have to ask them or tell them that you want a longer uh, lease term, okay? Um, now, something else to think about is inflation. And so every year around and about, the average was before 2020 um, in the era that we are now in, in our new norm, it was up to 3%. And what that meant is that your office space, uh, the rent would increase up to 3% every time you renewed your lease. And so uh, one of my offices, I actually had a two-year lease. And what ended up happening is when it was time for me to renew, instead of it increasing like the regular $15 or $20, they not only jumped up with inflation, but it was a high demand in that particular location. So they tried to increase my rent by $200. Now, of course, I negotiated that rate a lot lower, pretty much 50%, because I also had two offices within the same building. And so you definitely want to do your research in terms of what is the inflation rate in your particular county, in your particular city, and then what will happen once your lease is over. Another thing you want to think about in terms of contracts is the payment. How are you able to pay your rent? Are you able to mail in a check? Can you do bill pay through your bank? Can you pay via an online portal, maybe that they have set up through the office portal, or can you set it up where it automatically comes out of a debit card or a credit card or maybe your checking account? And so these are some things that you definitely want to consider when you are overlooking the contract. And these are other areas as well. So for your mail, can you receive deliveries? Um, maybe even when you're not there, is there a receptionist or do you just have a mailbox? How how big is the mailbox? You definitely want to request that you can see the mailbox because you don't want to order a big package from Amazon and then you have nowhere to put it and then they return it back or you have to go to another location then to pick up your mail. So you want to be very clear about how do you pick up your deliveries. Also, do you want to own an office or do you want to sublease an office from somewhere else or someplace else? And if you do sublet an office, is the leaser a therapist? Meaning, are you walking into someone else's establishment, someone else's group practice? And then what are the expectations in regards to that sublease space? Also, something you want to consider when you're looking at the contract is what is the difference between an internal office space, meaning there are no windows, versus a window office. So something to think about when you're talking about space tips is one, is there room for growth? Maybe your private practice is going to move into full time, but maybe you are just starting. And so let's just say if you start off with one or two days a week, are there other days available in that same office? Um, also, can you add on more days? And if you can add on more days, does it need to be approved? Do you just write your name like on the physical door, on the back of the door? Do you go onto a Google spreadsheet and update the calendar? And also what are the pay changes? as it relates to you adding more days. That is really, really important because my experience has been, depending on which office I have, the accessibility of the office may change, especially if I go from weekdays to morning to evenings to then a weekend day. 
Okay, hope that that makes sense. So those are some space tips. Now, the second area you want to look at when you are considering a new office space is the physical building. So what is the location space like? Are you near a freeway or public transportation like the buses? Or is there space for Uber or Lyft to come and drop clients off? Also, you want to look at the part, the, the hours, I'm sorry. So with the hours, very, very important is what are the hours for the building? Uh, this is something that I ran into, especially when I started hiring out for my group practice. The doors locked at around 7 p.m. downstairs, which meant that if I had a client that came to a session after seven or at eight o'clock even, they would not even be able to get up to the elevator into the lobby to wait on me because the doors would lock, which means that we have to make sure that we either provide them a code or if there's no one around, if receptionists are gone in your particular building, if you have the luxury to have a receptionist, ours would leave at five o'clock. I would literally tell my clients, if you agree to come at this time, please note that I will call you or text you when I'm coming downstairs to open up the door. And yes, that's a little bit inconvenient, but if you want to see clients beyond doors that are locked and you're in another session, how can they get in? Because you don't know what time they're actually going to come. So you want to make sure that you understand the times that doors may lock, not just to your office or to the corridors, to your lobby, but also to the physical building. Also, you want to know the hours for the weekend. Is your office even open on the weekend? Is it automatically locked on Saturday and Sunday all day? One of my second offices um, in the location where I had my main office, because we had multiple clinicians and we needed more room, is that when they would work on Saturday and Sundays, the offices were locked. And so their clients knew that in order to get into that building, they, the clinician would call them and say, you know, you're sitting in a car, go ahead and come on in. Okay. I'm at the door. So those are our tips. And then in terms of security, what are the security hours? Does a building even have security? What is the phone number? Now you may be wondering outside of emergencies, why would I need to contact security? In another section, I'm going to talk to you about your keys being locked inside your office, but maybe security is the person that you need to call. Um, where is the security hub located? Are they in your building? Are they away from your building? Do they not come until after hours, like after 10 o'clock? And then maybe they just do like a drive around. But what are the what is the physical location? In my office, we actually had a security on the grounds, it was an actual company and they had an office that was on the first level. Um, also, you want to get a clear understanding, especially if they are not physically on site, when do they do their rounds? Because again, if you are locked out or you need help with something, you want to know that you're contacting them at the right time. Um, also with building, let's just say you need help. As I just mentioned, you lock your keys in your room. This has happened to me once. It happened to a couple of my clinicians a few times. One time the security guard was nowhere to be found. Um, I didn't know at that time that we can contact the office manager. I just now have her phone number and we can text her. But one of my clinicians, her whole purse was in there. And so she literally only had her keys because the bathroom key was linked to her actual key. And granted, we put this in the orientation, make sure that when you, yeah, go to your bathroom, go to the restroom, that you lock your door because we have HIPAA protected information inside those offices. But at the end of the day, make sure that you, you take your keys, make sure that you always clip your keys like on your belt loop or that you put it in your pocket, even if you're walking out the office to get someone in the lobby, because at any given point, maybe the air conditioner can come on and your door can just automatically shut. And so if your keys are locked in your office, you want to know whom should you call? And then this also happened and then it was fixed after it happened to a few people in our whole, excuse me, in our whole office space, which is do they have a general main key to the floor and do they actually have a special key to get it to your office? Because we were on a floor with therapists, with lawyers and other people that have client privilege protected information behind closed doors, even though it's in a locked file cabinet, I would hope. 
it does not mean that the building has an agreement to go into our physical space outside of emptying, emptying the trash. So I remember when these things would first happen and they would end up calling the manager. This is one of the reasons why my therapist was actually locked out of getting her purse. And I ended up dropping her off at home, but it was a very inconvenient weekend, I am sure for her, is that they had to set up regulations with the security company, I'm guessing to sign off of not touching anything in our office, making sure that they check our ID once we get into our office. That's It's really our office because we have protected information. So you want to make sure that if you are locked outside of your office, that they can actually come into your office. In terms of the bathroom, you want to um, know who has the keys, meaning do you get a copy and the lobby gets a copy? What if you're in the middle of a session? Should your clients knock on your door? Hopefully not. If you have um, like a hang up key ring outside, maybe that's something you can do. That's what we did when we had our group practice. And especially on the weekends, we would put the key on a hanging key and say one is male, one is female. It was separate. And then they will grab the key and then put it back. During regular hours, the receptionist area had a placard that said women and men uh, restroom key and then bring it back. Another thing you want to consider in terms of building is what is parking like? Does it cost money or is it free. And if it does cost money, how much money per hour? Something to consider when you're seeing children is that if you see a child first, and then maybe you tack on the collateral session or a conjoint session with the family at the end, will that go over one hour? And how early are your clients coming to the session? Because that may dictate how long they have to pay for parking. Okay. Now, also, when you are looking at building structure, you want to think about handicap accessibility. Also, this is a regulation. It's a rule um, that you have to have certain things in place to be on insurance panels. You want to check with their kitchen. Uh, is there a refrigerator that you can maybe house your lunch? Is there a microwave? Is there a cleanup schedule? Or is there a clean out schedule? At our office, we actually had a schedule where every Friday admin, the receptionist, will come and clean out the refrigerator every single Friday. And what they would tell us, especially for weekend clinicians or people who were there, because maybe our schedule starts on Friday. And I want to bring something that you know was broken up into multiple meal preps because I don't want to keep bringing it every day. So they you know, got to know us and they just said, like, put a sticker on it that says, like, do not throw away and then put the date on it. Another thing that gets overlooked is how your furniture will be delivered, especially if you are having a delivery company or you yourself are bringing it on like a truck. And so there are certain delivery hours that we can move furniture in the office, I'm sure, for liability. My office had a rule that we can only do it after hours, like after 5 p.m. and or on the weekend. So you definitely want to consider that. Now let's talk about number three, which is energy. In terms of your space, who else shares your space or the office floor? And what is their energy like? Is it welcoming? Do you talk to them in between your sessions? Can you grab lunch together? Do they want to get to know you? Also check out other businesses. Um, in my office, we had lawyers, event planners, security companies, different types of attorneys. And one of the things that I, and tax people, CPAs, I literally utilized and collaborated with other business entities on our floor because we got to know one another. There were holiday parties. We would all do, you know, like, um, what do you call it? Like we bring all the food together and we make a list of who's going to bring what potluck. That's the word I'm looking for. And we will collaborate with one another to then refer one another to each other's businesses. So that's something that you want to think about as well is maybe get a directory of the other businesses that are actually in your building, even if they're on a different floor. Now, also you want to check your energy. How do you feel when you're viewing the space? Do Does it feel welcoming to you? Does it smell good? Um, does it feel good? Okay. Um, number four is internal. So um, just some basic tips is square footage. Always request to do a in-person tour. Make sure you bring your measuring tape, especially for couches, especially if you have existing furniture. Make sure that you measure the door. Unlike our home, you can't take the hinges off the door at a office space. And so if you have a certain type of couch or chair and it's too wide, it may not fit. Also, you want to ask the manager about decor. Can you hang wall? Can you hang up wall decor? And then what is allowed and what is not? Because some of them may not allow nails, but they will allow like that double-sided tape. 
Also, you want to ask about the internet. Is the internet included? Is it an extra cost? And if it is an extra cost, what is it? It may already be embedded in your leasing contract. Now, lastly, I want to share a true story, okay? In terms of me having four offices, y'all, in two years. And so bottom line is when I first started my private practice, I was very much part-time. I was working for Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health full-time and overtime. I was also teaching at three institutions. So I was seeing like three to five clients to begin with. I had no blueprint. I had no client avatar outside of like me loving to work with teenagers. And honestly, I was just rolling with the flow. So my very first office was in Los Angeles. It was in a very prestigious neighborhood by the Beverly Center. And my thing was, whoever calls me first, that's where I'm going to find an office. I would highly suggest you don't do that. And so the person worked something out with me where we made a contract to, um, you know, for me to sublet it out like hourly three hours minimum per week. But what I found out over time was that because I didn't understand my value, because I didn't understand how to set my fees and I didn't set clear boundaries with clients showing up to their session, what would happen if they canceled again, because these things are not taught. I didn't have a coach. I didn't know that coaches existed for helping me or they didn't exist back then to help me build a profitable private practice. I pretty much was in the hole. And so I was breaking even with seeing some of the clients um, and then forking out the money to have like a business license in Los Angeles alongside of paying the person who owned the space. So I started to recognize over time, my clients were inconsistent. So I said, you know what, let me look at offices on the East because that was on the West side of town in Los Angeles County. So then I stumbled across um, some type of ad in Cerritos. And my second office was in Cerritos. It was a um, very small office, about 150 square feet. The the energy was very, um, you know, nice. And, you know, I wasn't really feeling the furniture, but at that point I wasn't going to be very nitpicky because I really wanted a space. The price was right. And then I increased my rates just a little bit. So I started seeing a transitional age use. She had just turned 18 and then her schedule changed. When her schedule changed, availability, it then created a conflict because that office space was no longer available. So that owner told me, hey, there's a group office across the hall. They have seven offices. I only have three, but our offices are full on the day that you need. You may want to check with them, let them know that I sent you. So literally two weeks later, after the second office, I ended up moving into the third office right across the hall. So that space worked out fine. I was there for about two and a half years. That's where I also started my group practice. The room that they gave me was very spacious. It was actually the play therapy room because a lot of people there did not see kids. It was actually the largest room, no windows, but it was okay. And then what ended up happening was I saw a college student in two weeks in a row, I had put my name on availability on the wall and in the front office. And when I got there, someone else was in my office. And that was not ideal. And being the person that I am, I did not want to knock on the door. I don't know what's happening with that client that's sitting on that couch. You know, they may be crying or something. So I don't want to interrupt that therapy session. So luckily, because the, the young lady, she was like pretty cool. I was like, you want to go outside? Do you want to go sit on the stairs? Because it was pretty much after hours. She was like, oh, I'm cool. I just meet with me anywhere, you know? And so we went and sat on the stairs. Then one day we took a walk. And after that, I started looking for another office space because it started to happen more frequently where clients were not respecting the schedule. And so I started to just look around online and then I stumbled across an ad in the office that not that I currently have right now, because I did close it in May of 2020 due to the pandemic. However, I was at that office for over five years. So I initially did a transition phase where I was at both of these offices. And then eventually when I left my job and then I finally went full time, I ended up transitioning fully into what's called a virtual office space. So what's nice about that space is that they also have perks of using the conference rooms, which was very helpful when I had interns and when we would have case conference and consultation. Then when I stopped working in the correctional facilities, I really needed a a office space with a window. So I started with a very small corner office. Then I moved into a office that was maybe 300 square feet. It was probably the same size as that previous office location, the play therapy room. Then when I went all in to my private practice, um, just teaching on the side, I then said, I need a window. Let me know when one is going to be available. And then they upgraded me to a window office and I could have not 
ask for anything better. And so that was the office that I had up to the point where I was able to shut down my office, unfortunately due to the pandemic, but then I moved into, um, you know, more telehealth. Okay. So please learn from my experiences. I hope that you really heard all the tips. Make sure you rewatch this video if needed so that you can take notes, but don't reinvent the wheel. Take seriously when you go look for an office space, what it is that you want, and also look at your five-year map. If you don't have a five-year map, I would highly suggest that you check out the Dope Therapist Academy. It is my signature program for helping mental health therapists like yourself be able to build a profitable framework back office so that you can leverage your time, engage in what I call CEO activities, be able to work with your ideal clients and also understand your niche so that later it can lead to streams of income in your business beyond private practice. So I really hope that you enjoyed this video and this podcast. Make sure that you subscribe, share this episode with other mental health therapists that you think this will be helpful for. And even if clinicians do not, even if you do not have a private practice yet, this information is will change your life. It will change your business because you definitely want to get to know about how to run a profitable business even before you start. And so make sure to check out the show notes, make sure to subscribe, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye. (laughs) 